So good. God, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Um, this evening, I would, um, you know, lay said in emphasis where the love of God is concerned, you know, God's love for us. Uh, we've touched it somewhat. We're going to go deeper further. Um, as, as the month rolls into March, um, every Sunday in March, I'm, I'm excited already about what I'll be teaching in the month of March. We'll be learning together. Um, I trust that there'll be a greater revelation of the love of God. So tonight we'll um, just fuse a couple of verses together. And, you know, so we'll pick it up again. If you remember our first John chapter four, so first John chapter four, and then the 16th verse, first John four sixteen. So we'll kick off from there. So, so, so beautiful a, a verse in the Bible. So important. Um, first John, you know, first John is just that area of the Bible where you get to before you get to the book of Revelations and uh, Revelation. All right. Um, so too many times we don't go there for some reason. You know, I think people, ex except you intentionally do a Bible reading or a Bible study, trying to just easily skip it, except those you know, verses like 3 John verse 2, I wish above all things you prosper and be in hell. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, behold, the man of love the Father has lavished upon us. 1 John 4, 7 and 8, you know, let us love one another. God is love. 1 John 1 and 9, confess your faults. So we, we do have those verses, you know, all across, you know, the epistle of John that we get a peak. But it's, it's beautiful when you read the entire, you know, entire place. Like we looked at, all right, last week, how that, John always said to himself, I am the disciple that Jesus loved. It's me. I'm the one. I'm the one he loves. There was that, that confidence and that faith. And, you know, just in the next few minutes tonight, I, I want you to be able to say, oh, God loves me. <laughs> God, God loves me. God loves me. So, you know, First John chapter 1 and then um, chapter 4, rather, and the 16th verse of First John 4. We could do the new King James. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Do N N N K J V. All right. Thank you. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who, who loves abides in God and God in him. But the important, you know, the A part is what we're focusing on for tonight's study. It says we have known and believed the love that God has for us. So there's something about knowing it you know I, I know and i believe the love that god has for me i know and i believe the love that god has for me you might want to say that like two times i know and i believe that god loves me i know and i believe that god loves me i know and i believe that god loves me all right god loves me so important and we you know, she, she don't play with that level of revelation. I, I want us now to go to Romans and then the eighth chapter of the book of Romans. We could just pick it from the 26th verse. I'll just build a point straight from 26. We're going like towards the very end of it, but Romans chapter eight and then verse 26. It says, likewise, the spirit also helps in our weaknesses. Watch this. For we know not what we should pray for, as we ought but the spirit himself makes intercessions with groanings which cannot be uttered so the spirit helps in our weaknesses and i want you to understand the particular weakness all right the bible is referring to here is not a weakness like a physical weakness it's not an emotional weakness it says likewise the spirit also helps in our weaknesses we do not know we do not know what we should pray for as we ought and you have to understand what it's saying. It says, we don't know what to pray for as we ought. It didn't say we don't know what to pray for. I mean, you know to pray for yourself. You know to pray for family. You know to pray about your future. You know to pray about stuff, all right? Your nation and all of that. So, but it's not saying you don't know what to pray for. It says, we don't know what to pray for the way we ought to. So in as much as I want to pray for family, I don't know how to pray for family the way I ought to. And this, my dear brothers and sisters, this is one of the classic reasons why we should spend time praying in tongues, all right? Just allowing the Holy Ghost to flow those words through our mouths. There usually are, you know, limitations or should I say hindrances, all right, to praying in tongues. 
And one of it usually is the mind. The mind begins to argue. I don't know what I'm saying. I don't know what I'm saying. Get me out of this thing. I want to say what I want to say the way I want to say it. Your mind wants to be in control. Your mind will have you praying, your understanding, but it's limited, okay? So you say, for instance, you want to pray for a particular uncle of yours. You want to pray for him. And they say, okay, God bless my uncle, bless his family, bless his kids, uh, provide for them, keep them, protect them, and all of that. There might be a decision your uncle wants to make tomorrow that would completely, completely, all right, just wreck everything he's been working for for the last couple of years. The Holy Ghost knows that. So when you allow the Holy Spirit to pray through you, you're able to pray into the specifics of that very matter. And then sometimes you find that when you're spending time praying in tongues, you're not leaving a particular matter. You go away from it, you come back. You go away from it, you come back. It's the Holy Ghost saying zero in on this as something to birth, something to pray out, something to push through on this. Don't leave it alone, all right? And for me, that's one of the ways. <laughs> that's the love of God in operation because our prayer is not limited to our knowledge. Our prayer is not limited to our language. Our, God gives us the holy spirit to help us pray beyond what we know so beautiful beautiful verse so i might come into tongues a bit again before we close but anyway you know likewise the spirit also helps in our weaknesses for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought but the spirit himself makes intercessions with groanings which cannot be uttered now verse 27 tells us and, and 27 is beautiful okay so let's see how you know, the Holy Spirit speaks through Paul to put this up. Now, he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. The Holy Ghost sees our thoughts and is able to pick what's in our thoughts in the words we speak when we pray. And he aligns our thoughts with the thoughts of God. He aligns what's in our heart with. That's why sometimes, which has happened to me a number of times, you went into prayer praying about something and then you left the place with a different thought how the holy ghost took what you were thinking of switched it in the place of prayer to how god will have you think about the matter and that's that's beautiful so now verse 28 and we know and i want you to know that and we know for we know and okay and we know <laughs> that all things work together watch this all things all things work together all things work together, all things work together for good to those that love God, to those that are called according to his purpose. All things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. And I speak that to you right here, that all things work together for you. All things work together for you. All things in the name of Jesus, all things work together for you. You got that? All things work together for you. So he says, all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to to his purpose, verse 29, for whom he foreknew, he also predestinated to be conformed to the image of his son, that he, that's the son, might be the firstborn amongst many brethren. Okay, so are you ready? <laughs> verse 30, moreover, he did <laughs> predestinate them all, he predestinated them also, he called them, and he who called them, he justified them, and he who justify them this is beautiful he also glorified them now you might wonder okay where are we going with this 31 <laughs> it's it's building up he gave you the holy spirit all things work together for you because he has a plan for your life but then because i'm not staying on the 30th verse you might gloss over it and not get the meaning but i said he called you he justified you he glorified you. Solid stuff. Whom he predestinated, he called. All right? Whom he called, he justified. And whom he justified, he glorified. That means as far as God is concerned, you have a colorful, beautiful, glorious destiny. As far as God is concerned, your background might not look like it. Your present times might not look like it. The last couple of decisions you made might not look like it. But as far as God is concerned, he's called you. He's justified you. He's glorified you. And notice the Bible did not say he will justify. The Bible also did not say he will glorify whom he predestined, he called, whom he called, he justified, 
whom he justified, he glorified, and that is you, all right? So as much as I just went over it, there's a solid revelation in this verse. All right, so we just go on to the 31st verse. What shall we say to these things? Are you ready? If God is for us, who can be against us? Before we go further, I want you to say again like four times, God loves me. God loves me. God loves me. One more time. God loves me. You say, but how would he love someone as unlovable as me? In case anybody's thinking that right now, to think that you are not lovable is not God's thought. It is a lie of the devil. All right, John chapter 3, verse 16 says, For God so loved the world. And I hope you understand that the people in the world is the world, everybody in the world. All right, not Christians. God didn't love the church. There was no church before Jesus died. It was just the world. All right, we have the Jews and the rest of the world, and God loved the world, everybody in it. Okay, so Jesus, when he resurrected, said to his disciples, Go into all of that world. And preach the gospel. And what then is the gospel? You will see that God loves you. As in, God God loves you. God God loves you. He didn't love you now because you're born again. He loved you before you got born again. He loves everyone that is still not born again. For God so loved the world. Okay, so if he would love them not born again, or loved you and I before we got born again, now we're not just people in the world where his sons and his daughters what, what else will god do but to love us much more right not less if you want to look at it from a family point of view so what shall we say to these things if god be for us who guys who in any way who 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 can be against us all right who who can be against us if god is for us glory to god so god is for me God loves me. God cares about me. God is thinking about me. God's mind is full of me. So verse 32 now, and this begins to just show God's love. He who did not spare his own son, all right, he who didn't spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how will he not with him also freely give us all things? God didn't spare Jesus Christ. God hung Jesus on the cross. And John tells us there's no greater love than this for a man to lay down his life for friends. So Jesus displayed that great love, died for us. And God, Bible says, he that did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? So question, what do you desire? What would you love that God does for you? What would you love that, you know, is administered to you? Oh, I want this, I want this, I want this. But it's looking like it's difficult for God to do for me. God is saying, I didn't spare my son. I didn't keep back my best. I released my best to you. I released my best for you. Is there something therefore that you will be looking for in life that I cannot do for you? God loves you. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How will he not freely with him also give us all things? 33 now. 33 says, who shall lay anything? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? Who's going to accuse you before God? Who? Who's going to bring a charge against God's elect? It is God that justifies. Next verse, please. All right, 34. Who is he that condemns? It is Christ who died. And furthermore, and I want you to notice this. This is beautiful. This is beautiful. Watch this. So who is going to condemn you? That's what the verse is asking. So who's going to condemn you? It is Christ who died. And furthermore, he's also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also, please read that first, I mean, that last part, who also makes intercession for us. Very many times people wonder, so what's Jesus doing right now? We just somehow think he's sitting down on the throne, all right, sitting down on the right hand of God, or taking strolls down the streets of gold and all of that. But Bible says he has an intercessory ministry. He's praying for you. Yes, he is, all right? Now, he prays for us through diverse means, but one of it, again, is through the ministry of the Spirit and by speaking in tongues. One thing, again, about speaking in tongues is it is an unselfish kind of prayer. So you could pray in tongues 10 minutes. You could pray in tongues three hours. And then 
God could have, through those tongues of yours, prayed for some other person. He could minister through, you know, to someone else through your tongues and then you're busy praying. The Holy Ghost needs more and more people he could flow through. So Jesus is channeling prayer, channeling favor, channeling stuff in your direction. Many times people ask, why do bad things happen to good people? I've addressed it sometime. You know, we had this teaching we did last year and I thought about it. I'll still look, you know, teach about it again because bad things ought not to just happen to good people. Do bad things happen? Yes. I've noticed, all right, that God is never without a witness. I've noticed. The 9-11, all right, the Twin Towers, you know, September 11 in the US, there were quite a number of verified testimonies, okay? At least I, I watched more, more than one. I've watched more than one testimony. Someone was hurry, <laughs> even in the Pentagon, all right? I mean, I mean, I said Pentagon, the, the, the Twin Towers, and then he said he was up and the Holy Ghost was going to say to him, just run, run out, run out, run out, run out. Instead of taking the elevator, he said he sounded so like instructive. He ran down from the floor he was at, down the stairs. Someone else said, oh, he wanted to go to work that D Different, different testimonies. Dif different stuff came up. Okay. There was this bomb blast, you know, in Nigeria, the military cantonment. When it happened, I remember I was pastoring somewhere then I said, watch out for testimonies that God is never, never without a witness. There would always be some who said, God told me, God spoke to me. Sometimes it might not be, oh, God told me there would be this issue. No, it could just be, I started the car and I just felt, go back home. I, 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 I was trying to pick my clothes for the next day and I just felt in my heart, I, well, did, what, whatever it is. God's never without a testimony. And I've seen also as a pastor over the years that something horrible happens to someone. And then I ask, did you perceive that you shouldn't have made that trip? And usually I get, oh yeah, if I told my roommate, oh, I told, you know, someone, oh, I, I, I felt, I felt, I felt I shouldn't go. I've, I've seen that over the years, tested, proven, I've checked. God is usually never without a witness. All right, so we say, why do bad things happen? I don't have all the answers. Nobody has all the answers to why do bad things happen. But bad things shouldn't just always just come upon us and then overtake us. And when they do, if they do, when they do, Jesus already said there will be tribulations. And then we also know that there will be a trial of our faith. So when there's a trying of your faith, the Bible says God is not you know, wicked to allow you to be tempted above what you're able to bear. And then he'll make a way of escape. It means there'll be a strengthening of the spirit to overcome whatever trial it is. Do you, do you understand this? It's, it's a fuller topic. We might need to dig scripture after scripture after scripture. But God in his goodness, in his kindness, doesn't just fold his hands and say, well, let all the bad stuff that would ever happen, let it happen. You know, God, God doesn't do that. God loves you too much. God loves you too much. And the love of God for you, please understand, it is constant. The love of God for you, it, it's irrespective of challenges, irrespective of circumstances, and will bring you out of those challenges. Please remember what we learned two weeks ago, how that the presence of God is our key to victory. God is with us. God is for us. God is in us. And we need to understand that because he's with me, I will always win. All right? Because he's for me, all things work together for my good. And because it's in me, greater is he that is in me, I'll always overcome. So who, 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 who would condemn me? Jesus, who should condemn me, all right, cannot condemn me. The person who should condemn you. I, have you ever, you know, done something about it and felt so stupid, like God is not going to talk to you. God does want to talk to you. Let me tell you right here, right now, God is not, God is not in any way you know, saying he's not going to talk to you because you did something wrong. No. God loves you. And there's nothing you can do to make him love you less. Please understand that he loved you when you were unlovable. All right? When you felt unlovable, when you were like the world, when I was like the world, he loved us all the same. Who is it that condemned? It is Christ who died. Furthermore, also reason. All right, and he's at the right hand 
of God making intercessions for us. Beautiful stuff. Next, next verse, please. Glory to God. Verse 35. And I like this. What shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or, or sword? What will separate us from love of Christ? Verse 35. I mean, verse, um, yeah, 30, 36 now. As it is written, for your sake were killed all day long, were counted as sheep for the slaughter, 37 now, and I love 37. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. You have to get this. God loves me. So in all these things, I am more than a conqueror. Please say that. Say that. In all these things, I am more than a conqueror. In all these things, I am more than a conqueror. In all these things, I am more than a conqueror. Through him who loves me. So the one that loves me is not just loving me and then I'm going to just suffer and be stressed out. And my life is just going to go down, 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 down. No, he loves me and I'm coming out strong. He loves me and I'm coming out better and brighter. He loves me and all things will work together for my good. Remember that's in the 28th verse, just in this same chapter. So we'll read that verse again. It says, nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Verse 38 now, so beautiful stuff. He said, for I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, Verse 39, no height. Okay, I mean, you just see the list. No height, no depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing can take you away from the love of God. God is committed to you. God is excited about you. God is in love with you. God loves you. you you have to understand this Let, let's see the amplified bible okay from i just speak it from 35 amplified from the 35th verse and then we do 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 yeah 35 is fine amplified 35 all right hallelujah hallelujah who shall separate us from the separate us from christ's love all right, shall suffering and affliction and tribulation or calamity or distress or persecution or hunger or destitution or peril or sword or right, next verse. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Even as it is written, for your sake were put to death all day long, were regarded at and counted as sheep for slaughter. All right, next verse. Yet, oh, hallelujah. Yet, amid all these things, we are more than conquer us and gain a surpassing victory through him who loved us. Can we shout? Woo! <laughs> Glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. I mean, there are verses you read, but you shout. There are verses you read, but you get up from here. But I mean, I need to stay in front of the camera, right? Because <laughs> yet amid all these things, in the midst of all these things, we are more than conquerors. And watch this. We gain a surpassing victory through him who loves us. Not This is not, oh, because I love him. No, no, no. He loves us. He's committed to us. And once again, maybe, maybe it's happening in someone's mind right now. If he loves me, why is this happening to me? No, you take the revelation of this love that God has for you and tell that situation. See, you're changing. You're not remaining that way. I speak to you in the name of Jesus. I speak to you by that love that God has for me. You face that thing, right? The, the love that God has for us makes us victors. The love that God has for us doesn't make us whiny babies. Oh, if you love me, if you love me, if you... No, 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 no. It makes us victors. We are more than conquerors. Do you understand that? The conqueror is a guy who got into the fight, all right? The conqueror is a lady who got into the fight. Whether it was kickboxing, whether it was wrestling, you know, whether it was what now, WW, whatever, and all of that. So the conqueror got in, won, and got the belt. All right? You are not the conqueror. Ding, 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 ding. You are more than 
a conqueror. Do you understand that you are above that? It means someone got into the fight one. The belt came and said, take the belt. It's yours. And Jesus got into the fight. He got into the whole mess. All right. Was bruised, was battered, was nailed, was killed, he buried, resurrected, and then he handed all the victory over to you and I. Glory to God. In the midst of all these things, you and I or more is it sickness is it you know some situation in your life is it whatever 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 you're more than a conqueror that that's who you are that that's who you are we we have a lot of songs we sing you know in worship and honor of god but then you need to sometimes sing sing god's word to yourself okay just just sing sing i'm more than a conqueror form something create something and, and sing it you are more than a conqueror glory to god all right, and look at the last part. You have gained a surpassing victory through him who loves you. All right, he loves you. You've gained a surpassing victory. Let, let's see the next verse, please. Glory to God. All right, 38, and then we'll go to 39. Ooh, for I am persuaded beyond doubt. I'm sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things impending and threatening, nor things to come, nor powers. Okay, final verse there. I mean, this list is beautiful. Nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in ooh, all creation will be able to separate us from the love that from the love God, which from the love of God rather, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing can separate me from that love. Nothing can take me away from that love. Nothing, nothing, nothing. God loves me. God is not waking up every day trying to count the things you've done wrong. Second Corinthians, all right, chapter five, and then we'll pick it from the 17th verse. I know we know 17. I'm going to 19. We just build from 17, 18, 19. This is the gospel. This is good news. God loves you, all right? God loves you. Therefore, all right, thank you. If anyone is in Christ, is a new creation, all things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. If you're in Christ, you're not the same old person. You're not the person you used to be. No, you're different. You're new. There's just something new and different about you. All things are passed away. All things are passed away. All things are passed away. Now, I've seen very many cases, and I experienced that as a young Christian, some habits, some actions, all right, that you had before you got born again, began to show up again after you got born again. And then the devil starts, you know, making you feel, hey, you're not born again. Um, you need to get born again again. And then you find a whole lot of us, you know, going out again. One altar call after the next altar call after the next altar call and all of that. But no, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things are passed away. What do you do? You take the knowledge of the word to deal with that situation. You take the note, you say, hey, the Bible says all things are passed away, so all things are passed away. You understand? All things are passed away, so all things are passed away. All, all things, are, you, you repeat it, you say it. So you speak to that situation, you speak to that habit, you speak to that, you know, nagging thing, and like, hey, you're passed away, you're gone, you're gone. Because the devil has, you know, you know putting our friends around us to remind us and say, oh, you call yourself a Christian and you just told a lie, right? You know? Mm -hmm. You know, you say this and then just did this, right? And then, and then, and then, and then it weakens you. You want to pray, you can pray. You feel, you know, God is mad at me right now. God's not going to listen to me right now, you know? And we, we usually, we translate or transport um, the, the way we act with people. We take it into our relationship with God. So maybe you're mad at someone and then you don't talk to the person until evening or for a few days and all of that. You think that's the way that God is going to relate with you. You think that that's how God is responding. You think that's how God is reacting, but God is not a man. All right. So God doesn't do those kinds of stuff. He doesn't do those kinds of stuff. So you have to, you know, so you really like have to understand that. All right. Do you get that? So God is not mad at you, but what's the reading? Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. All right, let's, let's see the next verse. Okay, thank you. It now says, all things are God who has reconciled us through Jesus unto himself and has given us ministry of reconciliation. I want us to 
switch this verse into the Amplified. Um, all right. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank you. So it says, but all things are from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself, or right, received all right, us in, in favor and all to himself, and has given unto us the ministry of reconciliation, brought us into harmony with himself, and, you know, gave to us the ministry of reconciliation that by, you know, Lord, word and deed, we might aim to bring others into harmony with him. Now, next verse. Where we're going, 19. Thank you. And I want you to see this, guys. This verse 19. It was God personally present in Christ, reconciling and restoring the world to favor with himself. Did you see that? It was God personally. God personally present in Christ. God reconciling and restoring the world to favor with himself. And I like the next part. I want you to notice this. Not counting up and holding against men their trespasses, but canceling them. This right here is the gospel. This is what, and he said, and committing to us the message of reconciliation of the restoration to favor. So it says he gave us a message of reconciliation, meaning go tell people there's no more fight. God is not mad at you. God is not. But it's amazing how many people within the church of Jesus Christ need this to be told to them. Did you, hear, did you get what I just said? This is what God wants us to go and tell people. But it is amazing how that even we in the church, many people in the church need this verse to be preached to them. That God is not, see, see that middle place again, not counting up and holding against men. God is not counting up. Neither is he holding against men their trespasses, but he's canceling them. You know, we have this, um, so I messed up. So God is mad at me. And then God's going to say, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe. Now, this is in no way to condone sin, but this is in you seeing the love of the Father. There, there's a difference in this thing. There's a difference. How many of us parents would be super excited when our kids always have to run away from us? It's not even if you have to correct them and correct them, the, them running away from you is not the end point of what you want. It's not what you want. You just want it into just an action. How many of our parents lost us because, you know, the way, you know, we, they knew how to grow us up might have been that, you know, and, you know, so you find out that some parents lose kids that way. Some parents just knew how to act differently, you know. So you and I have got to understand that this is God's message. This is God's love. He's not counting up. He's not holding against men their trespasses, but God is canceling men's trespasses. God's mind is not filled with, you know, you say, God, I'm sorry. God, like, <laughs> you know, it's just 4 p.m., right? No, nah, 4 p.m. is late. Just 10, 30 in the morning. And it's the third time you're telling me you're sorry. <laughs> you know, God is checking like 10, 30 in the morning. You're already saying sorry three times. <laughs> You're not serious about your salvation. <laughs> and then that, that's how we see God. You're not serious about your salvation. All right. And then you say, oh, Lord, I'm sorry. And God goes, hmm, 4 p.m. <laughs> this is like the 15th time telling me you're sorry. God, God is not doing that. You say, like, how do I know? Because God will never set a standard for us that he cannot keep. I repeat. God would never set a standard for man that he, God, cannot keep. First off, Jesus had told his disciples in Luke chapter 7, if your brother offends you seven times in a day, and seven times that same day he comes back to say sorry, you got to forgive him. Jesus said so. So if he expects men to do that, he mean God definitely does better than that. Or else he'll be giving to us a more difficult, a higher standard that he himself can keep. God says, no, this is me. I'm not counting up. How many believers have, you know, just gone off the rail and said, it's just too difficult. I know I've done too many things and God can't have me back right now. I know God is so mad at me. He can't even hear my prayer. And, and they allow the devil and then they allow, you know, sin consciousness to, to preach to them. That's not God. God is not counting. 
Jesus told us a parable of a prodigal son, the story of a prodigal son, and it was about the father excited to get the son back home. But then we have this twisted, you know, God is sitting on his big throne with one fly swapper in his hand, and we are the flies, and every opportunity he gets to swap us, he just, you know, wipes us, you know, like, pew, pew. That, that's not your father, okay? He's not looking for the, you know, next opportunity to hit you or to thump you. So this is the word of God. This is the word of God, all right? Look at the 21st verse. It just, it just explains the love of God. This same Second Corinthians 5 and 21. For our sake, guys, for our own sake, he made Christ virtually to be sin. Who knew no sin? Jesus didn't commit any sin. You remember that Hebrews chapter 4 tells us he committed no sin. God made the person who committed no sin to become sin. Watch this. So that in and through him, we might become endued with, viewed as being in an examples of the righteousness of God. What? We, yeah. So we are now endued with, we are viewed as, we have become actually the righteousness of God. <laughs> All right. I mean, we're approved, we're, ex we're, we're accepted. We're in right relationship with God by his own goodness. We didn't sin. I mean, we, we didn't do anything righteous. He didn't sin. But then all of our sin was placed, all our sin got placed on him. And God gave us the gift of his own righteousness. Yes, that's what God did. All right. It, it's, it's not because of something you did. It's just, it's his love. It's, it's, it's his love. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 17. Hebrews 10, 10, 17, just one verse. There's so much you could read on Hebrews to build this point, but I just want you to see that one verse, you know, just, just, just to further what we had seen in the 19th verse of this second Corinthians, Hebrews, the 10th chapter, and then the 17th verse, God loves you. Okay. God loves you. He then goes on to say, and this is just, like I said, one verse, just about just a point. He then goes on to say, and their sins and their law breaking, I will remember no more. No more. No more. God, God, God has what now? Amnesia. All right. Illustration's sake. Okay. When it comes to sin, God says, I, I can't remember. You know, so when, when you come to God and like, uh, God, I know I told you I'm sorry yesterday. I just hate to come today again to say I'm sorry. You know, I, I, and you know, I know like, say what? I, I can't remember. <laughs> I, can't, I can't remember. What are you talking about? I hope you got the joke. God is saying, I, 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 I don't remember. I mean, God, God knows everything. He declares the end from the beginning. He's omniscient. But he's saying on sin and lawlessness and all, he doesn't want to keep a record of those kinds of stuff. God will not, listen again, please. God will not give us a higher standard all right, a standard higher than his. He, he won't do that. Did you get that? He won't do that. God is love. Don't forget. God is love. All right, God is love. Hope you know that. So once again, he said, their sins and their wickedness or lawlessness or law-breaking or trespass, I will remember no more. Someone, you're going to tell yourself, no, no more. No, no more. No more. No more. Glory to God. First Corinthians chapter 13 and then the fourth verse. So looking at it on Sunday, but it fits in into this very well because it's it's the standard that God gave us. For this is First Corinthians thirteen. So this, like I said on Sunday, is the catalog of love. It's it gives us a description of what love is. But then God is love, so this is giving us a description of who God is. So it says, "Love endures long, and is patient and kind." So this is what God expects of us to do. God wants us to be patient. He wants us to endure. He wants us to be kind. He won't give us a higher standard than he himself has. No, he won't give us something higher. Love endures long and is patient and kind. Love never is envious, nor boastful, or jealousy. Love is not boastful, it's not vainglorious. Love does not display self hardity. Ne ne next verse, please. All right, love is not conceited, it's not arrogant, inflated with pride, it's not rude or mannerly. All right, it does not act on becoming in love. God's love in us. So it is the love of God in us that we're describing, but it is God's love in us. So it is God's love. So this is God's love, right? 
God of knowledge does not insist on its own right or its own way, for it's not self-seeking, it's not touchy, it's not fretful, not resentful. So I want you to see the last part here. Takes no account of evil done to it, pays no attention to a suffered wrong. Did, did you get that? The love of God, all right? Takes no account of evil done to it and pays no attention to a suffered wrong. So this is God's standard for us. It means this is what the love of God will do. So it means this is what God will do. God will not keep account of an evil. So like we read in Hebrews 10, 17, God says, your sins and iniquities, I will remember no more. But what the devil wants to do is to remind you. He wants to remind you. I know what he did last summer. You know, I know what he did last winter. I know what he did whenever. He wants to remind you. And then you go praying and he, he wants to keep, thank you. He wants to keep reminding you, like, see what you did. It weakens your faith. It weakens your prayer life. It weakens your confidence in God. And he makes God to look like everybody else. Everybody tells me how bad I am. Everybody reminds me of how bad I am. Everybody reminds me of all the things I've done. And it makes you feel God does the same thing too. Is that not what God does? God hasn't talked to me since the last time I did something wrong. That is not God. That is your own impression of God. That's a religious person's impression of God. You know, that, that's, 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 you know. When Jesus even was teaching the Lord's Prayer, okay, I know we all grew up having to say the Lord's Prayer like standard prayer, but it was more like a prayer format. I think, you know, most of us know that already. So it was like a prayer format. If not, you read into the book of Acts and then you find them praying the Lord's Prayer. You read the epistles and you find them quoting the Lord's Prayer. It was like a format, okay? And then it, it goes, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And then he gets to forgive us our sins. But if you grew up like, you know, some of us might have, you know, some of us might have, you'd, um, you'll be taught to confess your sin first before you can say any other thing. You'd, and, and what that does is it creates what is called a sin consciousness, not a sonship consciousness. You have to understand the difference. All right, a sin consciousness, a slavery mentality. All right, it's that servant mentality. You know, I, I need to approach my master well. My master might be mad at me, you know, and all of that. So that's sin consciousness. So we're taught in, you know, you, you want to start something. Can we ask God to forgive us, you know, sins we've committed knowingly or knowingly? And, and then you carry that burden of sin, even when nothing ever is wrong. You just have to carry the consciousness all right you want to join in faith with someone you know prayer and you first of all have to confess your sin it's a consciousness it's a negative one so even when jesus like i just said was teaching the lord's prayer he taught them to ask for their daily bread before they got to forgive us our sin all right we will do the reverse we say you can't ask god for anything if you haven't confessed your sin now this is what i tell people if you did something wrong Right then, when you realize you did something wrong, then right there, say, Lord, I'm sorry for what I did. Don't carry it. And then it's time for church, or it's time to pray, or it's time to worship in your room. And go, oh, God, that thing I did three hours ago. When you, when you did it, I remember, then just get it off. You don't have to bring it again into that place. So come, Hebrews chapter 4, and then the 16th verse. Hebrews 4, 16. Thank you, Lord. Hebrews is a very, very classic, solid, solid book. All right, in, in the Bible. Thank you. It says, let us then, this is beautiful, fearlessly and confidently and boldly draw near to the throne of grace. Fearlessly, confidently, and boldly. Did you get that? Let us then draw near, fearlessly, confidently, boldly to the throne of grace the throne of God's unmerited favor for us sinners, it's contextual, right? That we may receive mercy for our failures and find grace to help in good time, all right? For every need, appropriate help, well-timed help coming just when we need it. I'm sure there are many times you need help right then, right now, right now, right now, all right? You need God to bail you out, even if you were the one that got yourself into trouble. It says, come boldly together, come confidently together, come fearlessly together. 
So that that won't be the time to go and not done something wrong. And not get get up and come boldly to get this thing. God loves you. Is this clear? Have I been able to help anybody tonight? God loves you. God is thinking about you, and He's not thinking about you to do you harm. He's thinking about you to do you good. He's thinking about you because he, he wants the best for you. Like we read in, you know, Romans chapter 8 and then the 32nd verse. He who spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How will he not with him also freely give us all things? God didn't keep his best away from you. God gave you his best. Thank you. You know, he who didn't spare, withhold. He did not withhold or spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all. Gave up Jesus to die. Gave Jesus to become sin. Don't forget, God hates sin. God does not like to behold sin. But the only way for man to be redeemed was for Jesus to become the very sin. And we saw that in Romans, I mean, 7 Corinthians 5, 21. So he says here, God did not, God knew what it will cost. Jesus knew what it will cost. And nobody held back. He who did not withhold or spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all. Hallelujah. Will he not, will he not also with him freely and graciously give us all the other things? Hallelujah. So are there all other things you desire? Could you take a minute if you want to and stare at this verse? He who did not withhold or spare even his own son, but gave him up for me, will he not also with him freely and graciously give me all other things? What are the all other things? Stare at the verse and you want to just say them to him, all other things, all other things. Father, thank you. You did not withhold your son from me. You did not withhold your son from me. So I know that these other things I desire are not withheld from me. Glory to God. Amen. Glory to God. Glory to God. Are you getting this? He did not withhold his son from you, but gave him up for you. Will it not with him also freely? Hallelujah. Next word there, graciously. Thank you, Father. Thank you because the things I require for life and living, they've been freely and graciously given unto me. The things I require for life and living, you give them unto me freely and graciously. Thank you. And you, you know what those things are. I know what my list is. You know what your list is. All right. Go ahead and just thank you, Father. 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 Thank you. Freely and graciously. You give unto me freely and graciously. You did not withhold your son. You did not hold back your son. But you gave him up for me. And you give me also all other things I need freely and graciously you give me all of the things i require freely and graciously thank you there lord you know what they are hallelujah psalm 84 verse 11 god is not withholding he didn't withhold his son he's not withholding anything from you thank you lord jesus he loves you he loves you god loves you he loves you especially he he loves you he loves you and he's free you know he's 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 very magnanimous with with his blessing psalm 84 and then the 11th verse of Psalm 84, you know, God, God is not keeping things from us. Thank you so much. You know, he's not. Hallelujah. See, see this one. For the Lord God is a sun and shield, all right? He's your sunlight, he's your shield also. The Lord bestows, present, he presents grace, all right, favor and future, present grace and favor and future glory, honor, splendor, oh dear Lord, and heavenly bliss. No good thing will he withhold. No good thing. So God is not in the business of withholding. You know, why don't I have this now? Why don't I have this now? Maybe God doesn't want you to have it. Maybe God, God is saying, I'm not withholding stuff from you. I'm not withholding stuff from you. I'm not withholding stuff from you. I mean, I'm not sure anybody, I, I, I wouldn't know that, but I don't think anybody right now has a list, you know, um, I want to be an astronaut tonight, you know, something like, should we say outlandish or something? So, I'm kind of like almost certain that whatever it is you're desiring is within the ambits of God's agenda for your life, is, is within God's plans for, hey, blessing you and saying, have a great life. So Bible says, and let's, let's see the verse again, for the Lord God is a son and the Lord God is a son and a shield. The Lord bestows present grace and favor 
and future glory. Thank you there, Jesus. He bestows present grace and favor, future glory, honor, splendor, heavenly bliss. He bestows it. He bestows it. He bestows it. No good thing. Hallelujah. No good thing with he withhold. Will he withhold from those who walk uprightly? Would you like to? Oh, thank you, Lord. Would you like to? I mean, no good thing. No good thing. I'm sure that thing you're looking for is a good thing, isn't it? It's a good thing. It's a good thing. Is a good don't feel oh and don't 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 treat God like a man, you know. Maybe um someone wants to favor you and then says, um, so what would you like? And then you feel oh, if I ask for three things, this person might get angry. And if I ask for 10 things, this person might get mad. This is your father. Load, load up. No good thing will he withhold. He didn't say ask one by one. All right. What what do you want? What do you want? All right, make a list. And then every day. If you have to, or whenever you want to, thank you, Father, because no good thing, no good thing. You're not withholding things from me. You give me things freely and graciously. So in the name of Jesus, I receive, I receive the free and gracious distribution of these things. I receive the free and gracious supply, supply of these things in my life in the name of Jesus. I receive, I receive. Isn't, isn't this wonderful? Isn't this assuring, guys? For the Lord God is a son and a shield. The Lord bestows present grace and favor, future glory, honor, splendor, heavenly bliss. No good thing with he with all. Hallelujah. Let's go to Psalm 115. We're going to close on that. Psalm 115, the 12th verse. Psalm 115, verse 12. You would love, you would love this one. Praise God. I believe you've been, you know, blessed already by the ones we've read. This, this is like um you know, so, so beautiful. Hallelujah. So he says, the Lord has been mindful of us. He will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Abraham. All right. So I want you to see this again. The Lord has been mindful of us. Mindful. All right. Split the word into two. Mindful. So reverse. The Lord's mind is full of you. Don't, don't wake up and think, well, there are 7 billion people on the planet. I mean, phew. <laughs> we're gonna have time for someone like me all the great men of god and great men of god are praying all over the world i'm sure it kind of like has all those ones on hotline and speed dial and me i'm like you know maybe you know the way it happens in all those <laughs> movies where they have to remove one plug and switch you know the switchboard and then you know so in your mind you know they have angels working on all that switchboard and you know, call from, so the, your own call is like blinking, but they don't have your time yet. They're plugging in to the very like vital calls, the VIPs, the VVIPs, the MVPs, uh, you know, and those are the kinds of people that God is interested in listening to right now. They are praying for nations and I'm praying for kings. I'm praying, you know, for, you know, I mean, for everybody, we have everything happening right now. And then they're heads of ministries and, you know, come on. God loves you. God loves you. Remember Romans 8? Nothing can separate you from the love of Christ. Nothing. All right? God's mind is on you. And that's what this verse is saying. And we're ending on this. The Lord has been mindful of us. He will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. The Lord has been mindful of us. You might need to say, remember what John did like we read last week? John will say, I am the disciple that Jesus loved. Me, I am the disciple he loves. He's me, he's me. So personalize. The Lord is mindful of me. He is mindful of me. He blesses me. He is mindful of me. If God had a wallet, your picture would be on it. All right? If God were an Uber driver, your picture would be somewhere in that car. Okay? If he was a manager, somewhere, a director in an office right now, your frame would be sitting in front or back somewhere. He, he's mindful of you. If God had to tattoo somewhere around him, it will be your name, all right? If you had to draw something on his chest, it likely will be your picture. He's mindful of you, mindful, mind full of you. Do you understand that? God is mindful. Let, let it sink in. Stop allowing the devil make you feel inferior when it comes to God. Stand tall with the knowledge of how much you know God loves you. Men might not think of you that way. It's all right. If God is for you, then proof. Like, uh, if God is for you, stand tall. Doesn't make you arrogant. It just makes you bold. There's a difference in boldness and arrogance. Thin line sometimes. There's a difference. Be bold. God is mindful of me. God has a plan for my life. 
Be bold about that. Amen. Let's see the next verse. Going to 13, but we, I mean 13 now. So the Lord has been mindful of us. He'll bless us. He blesses the house of Israel, the house of Aaron. All right, that's verse 12. So verse 13 now. Thank you, Lord Jesus. So, so beautiful. Glory to God. Hallelujah. He will bless those who reverently and worshipfully fear the Lord, both small and great. So God is not checking status or, you know, whatever. He blesses everybody, small and great, anybody. All right. So he's not just going after the big shots. And I know he's so everybody who reverently and worshipfully fear him, he, he, he blesses them. All right. So let's see the 14th verse. Glory to God. Amen. Hallelujah. May the Lord give you increase more and more, you and your children. I love this verse. May the Lord give you increase more and more. So this is like what? February? Has it yet been for you? Maybe some level of increase. Maybe little level of increase. Maybe no level of increase. Good stuff. Note this verse down. There will be increase. And when it happens, God says, I'm going to add more to it. And then I'm going to add more to it. And then I'm going to add more. Listen, none of us is ending the year exactly the way we're starting it. Because God says he's mindful of us. He's blessing us. And then he's increasing us more and more. Oh, but something great just happened to me. Hold on. More is coming. God said, I will increase you more and more. Remember how we all began? Okay, God loves you. God loves you with an everlasting love. He loves you so much. If he loved you as an unbeliever, he loves you now. He loves you now as his own child. And God is not withholding anything from you. It's the devil that withholds. It's the mind that withholds. It's our lack of faith or lack of, or inability to release our faith effectively that is limiting us. Our minds are limiting us, not God. God wants you to live large. He wants you to have the best of life. He, Jesus died all right, for you. He, he lowered his own standards so that you will be good and have a great life. He's mindful of you, not withholding anything from you. And the Bible says, the Lord increase you. Amen. The Lord increase you. Amen. The Lord increase you. The Lord increase you. The Lord increase you. Increase, increase. Whatever that means, for if it's relationship, if it's whatever, business, if it's finance, if it's whatever, the Lord increase you. The Lord adds to you. The Lord multiplies you. The Lord increase you. How? More and more. And it's not going to stop with you. It's going to go to your next generation. That's what the Bible is saying. The Lord increase you more. He didn't just say more, but he will increase you and more. So the Lord will increase you and then will increase you more and then increase you more and more and then it keeps going on. So in the name of Jesus, this 2022, you enjoy increase, increase more, increase more and more. You enjoy expansion, enlargement. You enjoy overflow. You are enlarged, enlarged, enlarged. All that concerns you, we call it blessed. Okay, we call it blessed. The blessing of God upon you is strong and it's flowing, it's fruitful. Every area of your life is flourishing exceedingly abundantly greatly with the blessing of god those things you desire you enjoy a free a free gracious supply gracious supply of good things because god is not withholding good things from you so in the name of jesus you enjoy a free and a gracious supply of good things you enjoy a free you enjoy a gracious supply of good things. You enjoy a free supply, a gracious supply of the job, of the relationship, of the marriage, of, of, of whatever it is, the business, the ideas, the expansion, the favors, you know, the connects you need. You enjoy, you enjoy, you enjoy a free and a gracious supply of it. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, your father loves you. And he's not withholding anything from you. So you stop withholding yourself from going, going, speaking, believing, speaking, believing. This year is a great year for you in the name of Jesus. The Lord is mindful of you and he's increasing you more and more and more and more and more. This is your song. It's your testimony this year. It is in the name of Jesus. Amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Give him thanks. Thank you, Father. We give you praise. We give you praise. Thank you, Father. We give you praise. You increase us more and 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 more. You enlarge us more and more and more and more and more and more. We give you praise. Thank you, Father. We give you praise. We give you praise. Glory to God. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. Praise God. 
Amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to God. All right. So I believe that helped you, blessed you. Um, I would upload it tonight. If you want to watch it again, you could just head to YouTube. Um, details um, right there on the screen. All right. So please feel free. Um, if you're here the first time, you could just click guest welcome um, on that chat side. And um, more messages on YouTube. So this will be there last week's there already. All right. And this weekend, if you'd love to join me for a four hour teaching, two hours Saturday, Sunday, 2 p.m. Eastern time, I will be teaching Foundation for a Successful Prayer Life. It will be beautiful, neat, solid, practical. Four hours of teaching, two hours of two hours Sunday. You, you'll be blessed. All right. So please, please be there. Um, Sunday, 9 a.m. And um, this Sunday will be quite enlightening, quite, um, quite informative, quite impactful. So please um, don't hold back. Reach out to somebody. Tell somebody about it. And if you'd love to give, the account details are right there on the screen. The you know account. So hey, I'm sure most of us should have it, but feel free. Um, feel free as 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 the Lord um, blesses you, as you know you enjoy favor. And you know, this is what I'm giving to the church, my church, you know, where I'm fed, blessed spiritually and all of that. Hey, go ahead and just hit giving at soc.ca. Okay, so it will be right on, you know, YouTube tonight. So please share, let someone else get blessed. The Lord is increasing us more and more. All right, in the name of Jesus. Thank you. Have a wonderful evening and I'll see you everybody on Sunday. Okay, bye-bye. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus.